EPS Audio. From the Evening Standard in London, I'm Mark Blunden and this is The Leader. It's day two of King Charles's French exchange trip and he's made history as the first British monarch to address the Senate in Paris. The symbolic tour is his first visit across La Manche since Brexit and he set out hopes for improving Franco-British relations, all in his very best public school French. Monsieur le Président, Madame la Présidente, Mesdames les Sénatrices et Messieurs les Sénateurs. And we've seen balconies full of Parisians cheering for a British king. So what will Charles hope to achieve? His speech focused on combating climate change, potentially leaving him on a crash course with Rishi Sunak after the PM put the brakes on Britain's plans to cut carbon emissions and let them eat crustaceans. Because today's history-making speech to the French Parliament's upper chamber came after the King and Queen Camilla dined on blue lobster and lychee-flavoured cheeses at a celeb-packed black tie banquet hosted by President Emmanuel Macron in the Palace of Versailles Hall of Mirrors. First from France, we're joined by Professor Peter Jackson of the University of Glasgow, who's an expert on Franco-British relations, and we asked what he made of the King's Entente of Sustainability speech. I think it was an important moment in rebuilding relations between France and the United Kingdom after some very turbulent years under Prime Minister Boris Johnson and then Liz Truss, where, in fact, the order of the day seemed to be to try and provoke and deride the French, which is an old pastime, but was particularly inappropriate in the 2020s, and in particular at a moment when the United Kingdom was trying to negotiate a good agreement, a favourable agreement to leave the EU. So this is a moment of reset. I think it was probably approved by the present government, whose language and tone towards Europe in general, but also towards France, has been, I think, far more moderate. But I'm not sure that the present government under Prime Minister Rishi Sunak would approve of the some of the things that King Charles said in Paris just now. Do you think there'll be any friction between Buckingham Palace and Downing Street? On the one hand, it could be that number 10 is speaking to one audience in the United Kingdom and King Charles is speaking to a very different audience across the channel in France and in Europe. That could be the case. Or it could be that the king is I think possibly a little unhappy with the direction of travel in British policy, the gov- British government's policy towards achieving net zero and the rolling back on some of the targets, which were widely perceived, even within the Conservative Party in the United Kingdom, as disappointing. I think what was particularly interesting to me was his proposal for an entente de durabilité, which really, I think, translates as an entente for sustainability. And his references to the climate, I think, reinforced that, which may not have been a priority for the government of Rishi Sunak in its relations with France. What do you make of all the cheering crowds and the soft diplomacy going on? Well, I think in one sense, it's not surprising because King Charles' mother, Queen Elizabeth II, was immensely popular in France, even amongst the centre, centre centre-right, centre-left on the political spectrum. I think that there is a sense that the king coming to France uh, invokes really interesting historical precedents, in particular, the visit by Edward VII, King Edward VII, the son of Queen Victoria, in 1903, where... Once again, these visits are most, I think, significant in some ways for their symbolism and soft power, as you say. In other words, the king turning up, walking along the Champs-Élysées, laying a wreath in front of the Arc de Triomphe and the Tomb of the Unknown Soldier, and saying all the right things about the importance of Franco-British relations to the United Kingdom. I think this is very important. What will be some of the big practical issues Britain needs to partner with France on post-Brexit? Well, there are a lot of issues where I think both sides have no choice but to work together, in particular driving forward the European response to Russian aggression against Ukraine, but also uh, European defence and regional defence in general, in particular with the prospect of election uncertainty across the Atlantic in Washington, D.C. The migrant crisis is another very important issue where there's a confluence of interests. In other words, it's in the interests of both Britain and France to work together. I think that Brexit marked a low point 
And one of the strategies of the Brexit leadership was to look for external scapegoats, if you like, external enemies to point to when Britain was experiencing difficulties first in negotiating an exit agreement to the European Union and ever since has actually been suffering, I think, from some of the effects of Brexit. Uh, this is, it's, it's very easy and it was something that both Boris Johnson and Liz Truss indulged in to question the uh, state of Franco-British relations, and in, in, in Liz Truss's case, even question whether or not France was a friend. Let's go to the ads. Coming up, royal historian Dr Ed Owens on the pomp of dinner at Versailles and how well the King's personal style travels. Why not hit follow in the meantime and give us a rating. Welcome back. Je suis flatté d'avoir été invité. Now we're joined by Dr. Ed Owens, historian and royal commentator, who's author of After Elizabeth, Can the Monarchy Save Itself? So what do you make of the splendid pomp and finery being laid on for King Charles? I think it's very significant at the start of the new reign. Clearly, the French extending a warm welcome to King Charles in a way that he would recognise. Typical also of uh, French state occasions. They do pomp and circumstance almost as well as the British do. And I think that the emphasis was clearly on a sort of two dynamic couples, uh, the Macrons and the King and Queen coming together as part of this very carefully staged event with modern celebrities, sort of saying something about both Britain and France as they move into the, the middle of the 21st century together. And what about his chemistry with Macron? I think both men clearly have an agenda, and that is to present the image of a united front of two nations with a warm relationship, really moving on from what have been a sort of difficult four or five years. This is a reminder that, if you like, as heads of state, the French president and the British king sort of almost exist above the fray of party politics, and that no matter the governments of the day, so to speak, this is an enduring and special relationship. How do you think his jovial personal style travels abroad? King Charles does things very differently to Queen Elizabeth II. If anything, King Charles's public persona is more intimate in terms of the way he presents himself publicly, a bit more like Prince Philip, his father, in that we'll look for a laugh where there is one. And both men very keen to present themselves as getting on very happily alongside one another. The relationship between Britain and France has been a difficult one politically, but you wouldn't have thought that to look at the two heads of state yesterday. How will the Versailles dining experience have been for the king? The idea of the state banquet is that you put on the best sort of show in terms of gastronomy uh, that you can. And, and France is renowned for its sort of gastronomic diplomacy, always trying to take things to another level, mainly because it sees itself as the as the centre of the, of the culinary world. But, you know, the same thing happened when presidents and, and past foreign dig dignitaries visited Buckingham Palace, and famously Elizabeth II. Her head chef was a French chef as well, who specialised in this kind of culinary art and design. So it's all about putting on the, the best kind of food that one can eat. The only caveat to that is that, of course, King Charles has a very specific dietary regime. So I think they were very careful in that respect. Can you tell us more on that? For example, King Charles mainly eats vegetarian. Uh, he does eat meat, but in very small quantities. He's also very specific about where the food that he eats comes from, where it's sourced. So he will have had a keen eye on the menu, wanting to know exactly what he was eating uh, and where it had come from. It's providence. Uh, and I think that's something that clearly the chefs took into consideration. In your book, you pose the question, can the monarchy save itself? And in your view, can it? And what does it need saving from? My answer to that question is a resounding yes, that the monarchy can survive, but in order to survive, it needs to modernise and it needs to modernise quick. It's lost the confidence of young people. There are as many young people under the age of 25 now who would like to get rid of the monarchy as who would like to keep it. It's also the case that the millennial generation, the under 45s, are not as enamoured with this institution as they have been in the past. So the monarchy needs to quickly find out a way to reconnect with the young. And I suggest in the book that there are examples in the past that it can look to in terms of dramatic dramatically looking to renew its public image, renew its public role. This has happened at least two times in the last 150 years, and it's time that it happened again. There's more on this story in the Evening Standard newspaper and online at standard.co.uk. That's The Leader. We're back on Friday at 4pm. <laughs>